Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us here today. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Jennifer Johnson, who is a professor at The Ohio State University. Jennifer uh, received her bachelor's degree from Carleton College, which is a very fine institution. I can uh, vouch for that myself. Uh, and then she went to uh, the University of California, Santa Cruz, worked with Mike Bolte for her PhD. And she is an expert in stellar spectra, stellar spectroscopy, and has worked on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and its many facets over the years, starting from Sloan 2, correct? Okay, so today she's going to talk about the evolution of the Milky Way disk. Um, please welcome her. Thank you. It's a real, um, real pleasure to be here. There's two facets to my, uh, my talk today. First, I'm going to talk about some of the recent things we've learned about the Milky Way disk, um, in particular from the Apogee survey, part of SDSS 3 and 4, and its offshoot, the Applecask survey, which combines Apogee data with that of the Kepler Astroseismic Science Consortium. And then for the latter part of my talk, I'm going to turn to uh, the next great thing after Sloan 4, when we're contemplating, the plan is to go even more viciously after the galactic disk. The galactic disk will not know what hit it. Um, Hans Walter Ricks likes to refer to this plan as the galaxy strikes back, etc. Um, I really do think that we are living today in the golden age of, of galactic astronomy, of, sorry, of galactic archaeology, when we can use the fossil record of the stars that have been born throughout the history of the Milky Way, their compositions, their motions, to figure out how the Milky Way formed and evolved. Now, I say golden age, but then I started thinking, well, you know, is that really fair? I mean, we not only have all the stellar spectroscopy, not just from Apogee, but from Gaia, Iso, and Gala. Um, we have uh, amazing seismology from uh, Kepler, Corot, upcoming test mission. We also have um, Gaia. Oh my god, Gaia, so exciting. So maybe that's not fair. Maybe we want to be, think ourselves slightly more rare. We want to be in the Astatane <laughs> age of galactic archaeology. And then I said to myself, well, you know, the only Astatane on the Earth, it's like, what, 30 atoms of Astatane at any given time from decay of uh, other particles. So I want something real. I want something permanent. So then I kind of went with the, the next, mo the most rare element in the Earth's crust that's stable. So that's iridium. We're in the iridium age of galactic archaeology. Um, so we have new tools for making progress on some of these really uh, long-standing issues. Now, I'm not going to be able to stand up here um, and tell you the answer to all of these, but I do hope to indicate that we've made some progress through these new techniques. So questions include origin of the thick disk. How much mixing is there between different radii in the galactic disk, um, secular evolution over the history of the disk? What is the star formation history of the Milky Way, not just in the solar circle, but throughout the entire galaxy? Uh, the explanation for the age metallicity relation, or lack thereof, in the solar neighborhood. Um, and something I hope to work on a lot more in the future are the time scales for chemical evolution, as in uh, the alpha to Fe clock and other things, and I'll talk, talk more about that coming up. And as I mentioned in uh, my, my lunchtime talk, um, of course, if you are only here for the planets, the chemical evolution of the galactic disk, which elements come out when, when stars are born, does matter for the history of habitability in the galaxy. But for those of us who care about galaxy formation and evolution, this is a slide I like to show that really highlights the problem, the fundamental problem that we currently face. Um, courtesy of the Manga survey and Map Bershady, these are six galaxies that have very, very similar stellar masses, probably live in about the same size dark matter halos, but you can see they have very different colors and very different morphologies. So somehow the baryons in these galaxies decided to um, manifest their light, to turn their lights on in, in, in very different ways, despite having one of the big property, stellar mass, be the same in each of these. So how do baryons live their lives in galaxies? The data I'm going to use to address this with the, with the Milky Way galaxy, at least in part, is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Apogee Survey. This is uh, a picture from now several years ago um, of the original Apogee 1 instrument in the lab in Virginia. Uh, John Wilson, the instrument scientist, Peter Frinchaboy, 
um, who is a survey uh, planner who's uh, still involved. All of us are still involved today. I don't know whose hand that is, but clearly it's very important. Um, <laughs> and it's an H-band survey of galactic populations. So the original plan was to have 100,000 stars. Now with Apogee 2, we're um, over 250,000 stars. Um, and the majority of them are red giants. Uh, fairly high resolution. Um, we are getting many, many, many elements. And I'm happy to talk about this in more detail um, if you're interested. So that's one set of data. Another complementary set of data is from the Kepler light curves for oscillating stars. So this is a plot I like to show to highlight the complementarity of spectroscopy and uh, seismology. So uh, spectroscopy looks at the outside of the star, tells us the composition, um, the effective temperature, uh, things like that. Seismology tells us about the inside of the star, which sound waves can propagate through. Um, and for example, the sound speed depends on the mean density, which depends on the mass and radius. And so from these oscillations, and again, I'm happy to go into more detail, we can get out precious information about mass and radii. So we're going to learn about stars inside and out. And it also cracks me up that if I plot data from both of these surveys, it can be hard to tell which is which. So let me help you out here. Let me put some axes on there. OK, that doesn't help. This is the Kepler light curve. And this is the apogee spectra, so time versus wavelength. Um, now, of course, we take the frequency power uh, spectrum of this to actually identify the primary modes of oscillation. Um, but, but that is the raw data that comes at us. And that's the inside, and that's the outside. Now, why am I so excited about masses for field stars? That's because uh, for a red giant, the mass and the age are intimately connected because it's tied to the hydrogen exhaustion time scale. So how do we get masses from astroseismology? We do what we call boutique analysis, which is you match the individual frequencies that you see passing through. Or um, we do industrial scale, where you characterize the frequency power spectrum by a mean frequency separation and the frequency of maximum power. Um, now, when you do the latter, the industrial scale, which is what I'm going to be focusing on here, you scale it up from the sun. Um, it will come as a shock to no one that red giants are not, do not have the same structure as the sun. So this is something we are going to have to worry about. And we're working right now on a kind of an empirical calibration of this. So that's what is not for long. Um, and the Applecast team and Mark Pinson in particular are working on cluster data to provide scalings for red giants. So that's the data. I'm going to be using. Um, now I want to focus on looking at the chemistry and the ages of stars in the solar neighborhood. So before I do that, I want to show uh, a plot to drive home this idea that uh, there's different time scales for chemical evolution. Um, and in particular, if you're looking for things that come out of uh, supernovae, type 2 supernovae, we're talking about things up in this part of the diagram, things like oxygen, uh, magnesium, um, a lot of aluminum, so the so-called alpha elements, are, have a large contribution from things that happen very fast in the history of the universe. Whereas things that take longer, the type 1As, um, are very prominent in the iron peak. So if we want to compare when you first start blowing off your supernova, you're going to have a lot of this and a little bit of this. But as time passes and the 1As uh, start going off, you're going to have a lot more of the iron peak elements as well. So what does that mean? So this is my very naive model of the chemical evolution of the solar neighborhood. If the, um, there was no inflows or outflows to really change the, the history of the gas, so basically um, uh, as more supernova got, went off, the gas became progressively more uh, metal rich. And uh, I just arbitrarily imposed a time scale on here for the appearance of the type 1As, producing a lot of iron. So this is very schematic. <laughs> do not do science off of this plot. Um, on this axis here, we have the aging billions of years. And on this axis here, we have the alpha to Fe. And in a very simple chemical evolution model, you would proceed along this line here of steadily increasing um, magnesium or iron abundance or that kind of thing. But here, you would have the um, 
the alpha to iron ratio of the core collapse supernova, the type 2 supernova, and down here you would have an equilibrium abundance, which is a mix of type 1a and type 2, and some transition between them. So this is your simple model. If you have a nice, just no contributions from other parts of the galaxy, left alone solar circle. Needless to say, this is not what the solar neighborhood looks like, and we've known this for a considerable period of time um, since, uh, you know, the work of Ed Vartzen et al. at least, uh, Geneva Copenhagen survey, Bensby and Feltig, etc. But here's my version of this. This is from the Apple Cask Dwarf Catalog, which Elder Serenelli et al. has just submitted. We have ages on this axis. We have, again, alpha to FE. I apologize for the, for the label there. I'm happy to talk about that. Here we have the uh, FE on H over here. And instead of having a beautiful thing like this, we have a mess. We have, uh, so several things I'd like to talk about here, step by step. But this is what we knew about the solar neighborhood. And people invoked a whole bunch of ideas about the galactic disk in order to explain it. Now that we have a bigger view of the galactic disk, more ages for stars, can we figure, uh, can we test that against this picture that we have going on here? So the first one you're going to notice is that there seems to be a bunch of alpha high stars and a bunch of alpha low stars. Um, these alpha high stars that are old are exactly what we expect them to be. But there is this dichotomy here. And this is not the best picture to showing it. But this is the thick disk versus the thin disk dichotomy. At the same metallicity, we have more alpha rich stars that are also more kinematically hot and more alpha poor stars that are kinematically colder. So one of the big questions was, um, what, is there an age difference between these things and such that this is older than this? Um, and you can see here, yeah, that, that it looks like there's somewhat of an, of an age difference here for stars of the same metallicity. Metallicity here, metallicity here, there's a shift in age. And Victor Silva Gary et al. has just submitted a paper where they did not look at these dwarfs. Instead, they looked at the more extensive giant sample that we have with Apple Cask. Um, and they did a separation of, of thin versus thick disk. Chemically speaking, they took the high alpha stars for the thick disk, the low alpha stars for the thin disk. But again, the tumory diagram, the kinematics for these things is very similar between the two. Uh, and this is what he gets. He gets age on this axis. He gets the normalized distribution. And here we have the thick disk. And here we have the thin disk. And yes, indeed, the thick disk is older. Now, this is not the first time that this has been claimed. Furman at all argued, in fact, that there was a very strong spike here in the age of the, of the thick disk. Um, one of the upcoming questions we have is to really characterize the realness of this spread. I think it is real, but um, to get a better idea of uh, um, the, yeah, <laughs> how long the thick disk has to form. But this is a nice, very nice example for a large number of stars, stars um, uh, thousand stars or so, that there's an age difference between the thick and the thin disk. It is as we expect. Um, and why do we expect this? Well, maybe because I've been talking to David Weinberg and John Bird for too long. This is uh, not the only paper that has shown this. And it still may be um, an issue with the amount of resolution that they have, particularly in the vertical direction. But this is from the ERA simulation. And what it shows here is the present location of stars that were born at different points throughout the disk. So if you were born at the very earliest phases of the Milky Way, this is your present day distribution. Um, and this over here tells you your density. So most stars are here, and then sprinkling of stars out here. As you move forward in time, so this is between to two stars born between 2 and 4 billion years after the start of the Milky Way. You have, a, again, a much more extended distribution here. Here, this is where you'd see the thick disk. The there's a nice thick disk up here compared to the thin disk of the most recently formed stars. So their argument is, is that the galaxy formed upside down. It started off as being a puffy disk, and stars formed throughout there. So they, of course, naturally would be older. And then the more recent stars uh, formed in a, in a more tight disk. So at least that seems to, to work. Don't know how well it works. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. How well it works with the fact that it's not completely smooth here. We are starting to think about that. <clears throat> OK, so that was one thing that we're talking about here, the fact that we have stars of similar metallicity, different alphas. They do have different ages. Um, the next thing I want to talk about here is the fact that there's an age metallicity um, spread. So if you look at a given age right here, you can see that there are some stars that are supersolar and some stars that are subsolar. 
Um, now, they have different alphas, that's fine, but what are they all doing at the same uh, galactic centric radius? Remember, our very simple model said at each age there should be a single alpha and there should be a single um, a metallicity. So why is there a big spread in metallicity for stars at the same age? Now, this is one of the, the, the main arguments that have been used observationally for invoking the idea of radial mixing. Um, this idea has been uh, kind of reinvigorated in the early 2000s from Selwood and Binney. Um, Binney and Schoenrich have argued, uh, again, have developed models for this. Minchev has discussed whether or not um, spiral arms can do it, whether or not the bar can do it. I'm not going to talk about the theoretical discussion of how you get stars to move. I'm going to uh, ask the question, OK, great, fine. So you want to move these stars from somewhere else in the disk. That's fine. But if you're going to say, here be dragons, and you look at the rest of the, the galaxy, you look, there we are in the solar neighborhood. There better be dragons somewhere out there to bring into the solar neighborhood. So is there a reservoir of, of stars that have the properties that we need to bring into the solar neighborhood, say, older, more metal-rich stars than what we would expect in the typical solar neighborhood? <clears throat> so this is not the most famous plot by Michael Hayden, but it is my favorite. On this axis here, we have galactic-centric radius from this is galactic center, this is the outer disk. We're here. Um, this is the height above the plane, and it's color-coded by mean metallicity of the population. We're here. It's more metal-rich inside. Yes! So if we want to explain the fact that you have a bunch of stars of um, different metallicities all hanging out here, you can maybe get away with moving stars from the interior because you've got more metal-rich stars over here that are doing interesting things. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want me to talk about the secondary red clump, huh? OK. <laughs> OK, so this is a potential reservoir um, for stars uh, that are, are metal rich to move over here. And perhaps there'll be old stars, which we'll talk about coming up. Because old metal rich stars moving here to mix with our younger metal rich stars would help explain the age metallicity spread. Now, in the solar neighborhood as well, though, um, the question is how fast do things have to move radially? Do you have three billion years old stars are the ones that show, start to show this radial mixing, or is it tighter than that? This is work in progress, so we still have a bunch of, of things to think about here. Um, but this is for a subset of stars. This is so-called secondary red clump stars. And the great thing about them is that we know their ages. Um, they're about uh, 2 billion years old, between about 1.5 and 2.5 billion years old. And this is a very small subsample of the apple cask sample. We have a much bigger sample now. Um, uh, but what we want to note here is that um, at a given astroseismic mass, or a given metal, sorry, yeah, at a given uh, metallicity, there's a range in mass, otherwise known as a range in age, or more particularly, this is, sorry, this is the way I wanted to go. Um, so all of these stars right here. They have a range in metallicity, even though they have a very confined uh, point in age. So now, maybe that's because the galaxy, the gas in the galaxy is not azimuthally completely one metallicity. And so azimuthal mu uh, mixing will take care of this. But if you need to explain a point 0.5 spread in metallicity by radial mixing, this says it has to have kicked in fairly early. So I'd really like to know how azimuthally smooth the gas and galaxy, the composition of gas and galaxies are. So going back, the next thing I want to talk about is these stars up here, the annoying stars up here, the young alpha rich stars. So they are quite young, four or so billion years, um, and they have alpha to Fe ratios that suggest that they are born out of pure um, core collapse stuff, or at least largely core collapse things. So they managed to hide from the 1As, which is a little bit unexpected. So in, back in 2015, a big sample of these were identified by Murray Martig, also for Corot data by Chiappini et al. Um, the red, sorry, the gray points in the back here are all the apple cask points. Um, here's metallicity, here's alpha to, to Fe. Um, and the ones she felt reasonably confident were young, are plotted here in the different colors. And you can see up here in the high alpha thing, there are a number of stars which are three, two, four billion years old. So I see them in the dwarf sample, and uh, Martig et al. and Chiappini et al. saw them in giant samples. So <laughs> at least that's consistent. Giants, dwarfs grow up to be giants, yes. 
that is reassuring. Um, and hopefully we can actually use that as a probe that we haven't uh, had much time to look into that. So what is the origin of this? So one idea is that there's a reservoir of these things, perhaps uh, things created near the bar or deeper in, inside the galaxy. Another idea which people immediately and correctly raised is that these things are mergers. We're pulling the ages off of the masses. And if you have some turnoff stars that got together, they can make a 1.5 solar mass star with the composition, uh, an alpha-rich composition, not formed recently, but merged recently and gave you that higher mass. So we wanted to look into this, and we're still looking into this. Um, but one of the main problems with trying to suss this out is the fact that for field stars, you don't have a mass. Why does this matter? Because for stars that were born um, with masses above the so-called craft break, above about 1.4 solar masses, they maintain their uh, rotation rates on the main sequence. They do not spin down like the sun. And as a result, when they head over to the giant branch, they still can be spinning, even with the expansion of the envelope, they still can be spinning relatively quickly. So why does that matter? Well, if you're trying to use rapid rotation as a merger signal, you need to know that there's no way in heck your star should be rotating that fast um, because it was a low mass star on the main sequence. So this is, uh, this is actually work that, that Jamie Tyre has submitted and published and everything like that. So on this axis here, we have log g going up the giant branch. And on this axis here, we have the surface velocity in kilometers per second. So a one solar mass star is immeasurable, especially at apogee resolution for this entire thing here. It lost so much angular momentum on the main sequence that when the envelope puffed up, it's just like, it's hopeless now. But a three solar mass star will have a fair amount of rotation, 10 kilometers per second, 15 kilometers a second, even as its um, uh, envelope is expanding on the giant branch because it was still rapidly rotating on the main sequence. So if we see a rapidly rotating star, we need to know that its expected vo uh, velocity is like this rather than like this. So if we draw a line here again at 10 kilometers a second, which is what Jamie did with the apogee data, um, we want to be, uh, again, we want to make sure it's down this mass range and not a three solar mass star. So the quintessential example of something that we said, hmm, that's a relatively low mass star that's rotating pretty fast, is this star here, right here. Um, so it's almost 0.5 uh, m sun more massive than all stars of similar metallicity. So if its mass is equal to its initial mass, it has an age of less than 1 billion years, um, which is quite low. And again, really a sign that it's probably a merger remnant. Um, so we think that a merger product, a blue straggler, is the most likely explanation. Again, uh, yeah. So the, sorry. I did not explain this plot very well. This is mass on this axis. This is Fe on H on this axis. And the stars that Jamie found to be rapidly rotating um, are, are drawn here. So this is, there are a bunch of rapid rotators up here. Um, these uh, could, be con yeah, yeah. <laughs> could be close binaries that have done something interesting there. But this is uh, an explanation for an alpha-rich star. So now that we've identified some of those, is that the case for all the alpha-rich stars, or is there a reservoir? Um, so K2 is being helpful in this regard. I, okay, I, I did, had nothing to do with the failure of the reaction wheels, but I will say that the fact that we are now looking along different lines of sight has been a blessing for galactic archaeology. Um, and so here we are, and now K2 is no longer looking just along the solar circle as the Kepler field did. We're looking at all these different directions. So can we find the reservoir? Can we find a bunch of red giants out there that have low or sorry, high alpha and, and young ages? Do not try and do science with the next plots, because um, I, I made them. And then I, uh, I said, oh, I should think about that. But I just want to show you that we're working on this. This is. Um, some K2 data that we have with apogee spectroscopy and um, uh, Bayesian uh, parameters from the, uh, the frequency power spectrum from Joel Zinn. Um, and you know, we've got some, we've got some, so these are versus mass here. So we're looking at things like, like, like out here, that could be an, a, a, an alpha rich star. This is along the K4 or C4 line of sight, which is out towards the Pleiades. Um, so now, Again, I'm not sure about the ratios here. This is in mass and not age. So many things to worry about, but we can start. <laughs> so I can try and see the dragons. Where are the dragons? Uh, I'm getting more and more of the opinion that most of them are stellar mergers. 
It's unexpectedly high stellar merger rate, but stars have surprised us before. OK, going back to the question of are the, the metal-rich stars that moved in from the inner parts of the galaxy putatively, um, they're metal-rich. We checked that with the Hayden et al. plot. But are they, are they also old? And this is one of my favorite plots that Apogee has made. This is uh, Ness and Martig, uh, Rick et al., 2016. This is a, an artist's view, sniffle, of the Milky Way galaxy. And superimposed on here are um, the ages for individual stars divide, derived from chemical ages based on C over N. And I'll be talking about that, how we got those ages in just a second. Um, blue is older, or sorry, blue is younger, red is older. And look, the inner part of the galaxy is in point of fat, both more metal rich and older. This is not a shock. Um, if you extrapolated from the bulge, we've known for a while that the bulge is quite metal rich and the CMDs for the bulge are quite old. Um, but it's an actual measurement now that the galaxy formed inside out, just as we expected from the Eris et al. simulation and other simulations, um, mostly concentrated here and has grown out. Um, so this is a very nice confirmation of that done in stars. And again, one of the things we need to do is to not just say, hey, these stars over here are more metal rich and they're older, but that the age metallicity relationship that we ascribe to these stars to explain the solar neighborhood actually works. So that's more detailed, multidimensional stuff that we, on the list of things to do. By the way, if anybody has any questions, feel free to call them out. Um, I don't mind at all, and I'd much rather you understand that I have a chance to correct myself so I don't send you down a completely wrong path. OK, so these, this is really exciting again. These are ages for stars across the, the galaxy. Now, even with Gaia, I'm really looking forward to Gaia. And I think for the subgiants, we will get exquisite ages for kind of the stars that are closer to, uh, closer to us in about two kiloparsecs from the, the brilliant uh, luminosities we're going to get for the subgiant stars. But that's that, that isn't going to get us to the galactic bulge. And that certainly, if reddening is playing any role, the luminosity in the star and the ability to put it on the HR diagram is more severely in doubt. So chemical ages have a lot of power. We can use them in red giants across the galaxy, but we have to believe them first. Um, and this was really prompted by a, a paper that, so the stellar theorists have known this for a long time, but it got whacked in the face of the galactic archaeologists in the Masseron and Gilmore paper of 2015. And then uh, the MPIA group really seized upon it. Um, and now we're working on kind of the second level of this uh, question, as I will discuss next. So what's the basic physics? I love it when ages depend on basic physics. It depends on what happens at first regip. So this is a plot of uh, M67, which is a solar metallicity about solar age cluster, one of the um, benchmark clusters of all of this kind of work. Um, so these are the apogee parameters, T effective, log G on this thing. Yes, our log Gs are not so great for uh, M stars. Um, I, again, I'm happy to talk to you more about that. I've got opinions. All right, but here we all are. And it's been color coded here by C over N, where blue are low C over N values and red are closer to solar. These points down here, da, 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 da. solarish, just as we expect. These points here, there's a drop. Guess where first dredge up is? Oh, look, it's right here. And the points down here tend to have one value, and the points afterwards tend to have another value that's different. But one value here, another value here. This is exactly what we expect from standard stellar evolution theory, where what happens here is that the convective envelope reaches the point that, the, that hydrogen burning has happened, and it dredges up uh, material that has been processed by CN cycling. So it's been through the CNO cycle, and that tends to make to raise the nitrogen and lower the carbon. How deep this dredge up goes, and so how kind of what the temperature is of the, um, the burning that you reach, and therefore how much carbon has gone over to nitrogen in equilibrium um, depends on the mass of the star. So it is a, a very nice physical prediction here that the location of first dredge up and the uh, uh, C over N after first dredge up depends on the mass of the red giant. And ooh boy, masses of red giants make me happy because you can get ages. Now, unfortunately, it's also sensitive to composition. So it is not, um, 
it is not uh yeah you have to you have to work at it a little bit but we're working on it um <clears throat> this is a pain in the butt <laughs> come back to that point so in Marta gets all his work on this axis we have c over n here we've got some masses uh, she compared with a couple of evolutionary uh sorry of, of stellar evolution models and they do a pretty good job um, one of the things that uh, Mark Pinsono and I and grad students are working on <coughs> is doing a, a, a most robust comparison that we can between the YREC models, the Yale Rotating Evolutionary uh, Models, and the Apogee data. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'll walk you through here in just a second. Um, and in part, we're interested in how, what, what are you allowed to tweak in theory? Is it rotation? Is there, is there some sort of uh, nuclear reaction rate, something like that that you can tweak? How much can you tweak? How robust are the theoretical predictions of C over N? And how good are the uh, observational uh, constraints and or the observational measurements of C over N? So Mark made this plot. And what it does here is it goes from lowest metallicity, which it, for us is minus 0.5. This is for the apple cask sample. So the apple cask, the first apple cask sample, so about 1,600 stars. Um, so that's how we have masses for them from seismic masses. Um, we have C over N here. Um, so anyway, this is the lowest mass bin, sorry, the lowest metallicity bin. Um, this is solar, higher metallicity, okay? Um, and the, the thing I want you to note is that uh, on the top plot here, the black points are the data, the red points are the model. At low metallicity, the C over N is too high in the observations compared to the, the theory. Uh, at solar metallicity and greater than solar metallicity, it looks pretty good. Um, if you just arbitrarily force this into agreement between these two, you do fine here, but the models then say, uh-uh, you're wrong at high metallicity. So you can either get, if you just do your standard uh, YREC models, um, changing the starting CN for every metallicity uniformly does not solve the problem. What we need is something like this, where this is the Fe on H, and this is the um, C over N that we need at the start of what the, what the star was born with. We need this to be the starting C over N abundance from chemical evolution. So we need more metal poor stars um, to be born with higher carbon and less nitrogen and so on. This makes sense from a chemical evolution standpoint because uh, carbon is a more primary element, nitrogen is a secondary element, so we do expect a metallicity dependence on the nitrogen yields, and as the galaxy becomes more metal rich, we get more nitrogen from, say, core collapse supernovae. So that's not unexpected. And spoiler alert, it looks like that's exactly what's going on here, that lower metallicity stars, chemically, evolutionary speaking, start with a higher C over N, and I'll come back to that. <clears throat> but first, uh, I wanted to show you a plot that I never thought ever, ever, ever would happen. <laughs> I, whenever, yeah. As, <laughs> astronomy oscillates between making me very cynical and making me uh, very sad of my uh, skepticism. Okay, on this axis here, we have log G. On this axis here, we have C over N from Apogee. I've picked two clusters here, uh, M67, solar metallicity, um, solar age, so about four and a half billion years. We know that based on an eclipsing binary at the turnoff there, so we have a very good idea of the mass uh, of stars on the red giant branch. We really, we really think we have that. Similarly with NGC 188, it's about a seven billion year old cluster. We know that from an eclipsing binary at the turnoff. So the WACS people have done just an amazing job, the Wisconsin Open Cluster Survey, of giving us robust ages based on masses at the turnoff for these two and other clusters as well. Um, in Apogee, we've gotten a bu bunch of, of measurements there. Um, well, that's rude. <laughs> okay. Um, this, the, the cyan points are NGC 188. I swear to God, I put labels on here. And the blue points are M67. About three billion years older than this. Look at that difference in the C over N. Now, we have to figure out what's going on with these. There are, there are reasons why C over N is uh, going to have it's going to have bigger errors than getting masses from, say, being in a binary system or having seismic frequencies measured. But if you told me that I could tell the difference in field stars based on their C over N between 7 billion year old stars and 4.5 billion year old stars, red giants, I would have laughed. That's because I just didn't know stellar evolutionary theory, so you all can laugh at me about that. 
Um, but anyway, this is very, very exciting for those of us who would really like to trace out, for example, the star formation history of the Milky Way. So anyway, that's where the age map came from. Again, individual uh, C over N measurements may have issues, but the thing I want to return to is the larger systematic effects. So there's a reason why I don't have a, a scale up here with actual numbers on it. Um, we want to calibrate these kinds of measurements using the fact that we know the age of this system, we know the age of that system, we know the age of other systems in the Kepler field, that kind of thing. So um, there was originally an, an age bar up here, a color bar telling you which ages those correspond to, but I think we can do a better job of, of getting absolute ages with all the cluster data that we have. Okay, but C over N is not without its problems. So the first one uh, I want to come back to is this chemical evolution. So this is a plot that from Chatron et al. in prep, and if I could ever, yeah, maybe on the airplane ride back, I will finish putting in my parts and he can stop yelling at me, so it's my fault right now, it's in prep. Um, on this axis here is log G for apogee. This is C over N. Um, what this is, is we wanted to take, we wanted to look at the metallicity effect in what we measure for C over N. So we wanted to have uh, a very narrow range in mass, um, but a wide range in metallicity. And the way we got that very narrow range in mass was just to take the alpha rich stars. Um, so those should all be older than 8 billion years. I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, and therefore, it's a very small mass range that these stars could have. So you should think of all of these as being low mass stars, but of different metallicities. And we're looking at what happens to their C over N as they go up the giant branch. Now, like M67 showed you what should happen. It should be the case that after first dredge up, nothing happens. And, it, and so these are going up in the metallicity, solar metallicity, down here is minus 0.7 to 0.9, um, and then goes minus 1 all the way down to around minus 2 there. So metal, let's look right here, right about uh, just below solar metallicity. This is exactly, exactly what we expect to see. <clears throat> there's pre-dredge up, there's dredge up, and there it goes flat. Not, nothing's changing there. These are, again, are all the stars in apogee, not just apple cask stars. Um, so we have a fairly large number, flat, flat, flat. Similarly, here, here's first dredge up here, goes there. Yep, so the first dredge up is happening where we expect it to happen. Yes. Okay, you get all excited, and then you look over here, and you're like, what the hell? Right, so it keeps going down, and nothing goes down like the minus two stars. Now, is this because our measurements are crappy? Our measurements do have larger errors down here. But this overall fact that at uh, low gravity, at very high up the giant branch, you see some very, very low C over N measurements is not unique to this sample in Apogee. This is the well-known extra mixing problem discovered in clusters by Brown and Gilroy. Um, done a very, this is, these plots up here are a tribute to Graton et al.'s 2000, very, very important 2000 paper. Okay, so chemical evolution. If you look here, Solar metallicity, right, right here. If you look down here, we are now above solar metallicity before first dredge up, even higher here. So this is what's showing us that before first dredge up, the original abundances in these stars, as we go more metal poor, the C over N gets higher at the, about the rate expected to explain Mark's result. So this is, I mean, it could, still could be that Apogee is screwing up, but at least the models are not screwing up. Um, there really is this offset in the initial C over N uh, again, I think it's due to chemical evolution. And then we see here the, the fact that it just no longer goes flat for the metal poor stars. Um, and here's just a really graphical illustration of this showing, whoa, showing, sorry, this is my punishment for moving away, showing mean trends. Um, so here are three different uh, 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 kind of bins of Fe on H. Log G is this way, so main sequence, tip of giant branch, C over N. The, um, the solid points are solid lines are the models that Jamie ran, um, and the dotted lines are the data. Yep, so solar metallicity is looking pretty good. It looks like a little bit more at FUNH of minus 0.6. And who boy, by the time you get to low metallicity, you see that there's this uh, steady and continuous drop of C over N as you go up the giant branch. We think that there's a source of extra mixing, maybe the so called salt finger instability or thermal haline mixing as proposed by Charbonnel. Uh, and Zahn, uh, but regardless of what the source of this is, and it's kind of interesting to think about the source, you do not want to be looking at your C over N for a metal poor star of minus 0.6 and thinking you have a really massive star. That is bad. 
we need to take these trends out um, before we start taking C over N and turning it into an age for low metallicity stars. So this is, this is both interesting from an extra mixing standpoint and from a, C, from a chemical age standpoint. But we can definitely look at this, fix this, um, and uh, improve the chemical ages in this way. <clears throat> so what do we have to look forward to? Um, there's an updated apple cast catalog that's coming out, um, which instead of 1,600 red giants has about 6,000 red giants. It has evolutionary states, core helium burning, not core helium burning, which again, something I never thought would happen, that you could tell me whether or not something was shell helium, or sorry, shell hydrogen or core helium. Um, and to calibrated masses um, based on cluster data. Sarah Nelly et al. has just submitted, as I said, the dwarf catalog. We've got some uh, interesting results for the, for the solar neighborhood. One of the things that um, we've just started doing, which looks like it's really going to be cool, is to compare and contrast the masses from seismology and C over N measurements. Um, among those stars that Mark has found are a bunch of stars with seismic masses that are about 1.5 solar masses. So probably that's their present day mass. But their C over N thinks that when um, uh, the, the, the shell burning, when the, when, the, when the interior was established, that huh, it was a lower mass. So they have quite high C over N ratios for their mass. And uh, again, we need to run some models to see about when mergers, because um, obviously if you took two zero age main sequence stars and blended them together, then you would expect a 1.5 solar mass carbon to nitrogen dredge up. How late can you blend them together? How early can you blend them together and have the C over N be sensitive to the structure of a lower mass star, but the present day mass be higher is something that we would like to test. But again, I think it's gonna be an excellent sign of the presence of a stellar merger. Another problem or that we've seen is that there are some stars out there that the seismologists tell us have masses of 0.6. Um, red giants that have masses of 0.6 and we're like, no. No, no, you don't understand. That's a you know, really old star. It's not correct. Please don't do this to us. Um, and uh, so one of the things that we do find reassuring is that they have the C over N measurements of normal stars. So there are a couple of ways, something, things that could have happened here. They could have lost some mass um, as they swelled up on the red giant branch phase, or the seismologist could be measuring some of these key seismic parameters incorrectly because a lot of the stars that have these 0 0.5, 0 0.6 solar mass seismic measurements have frequency power spectra that Yvonne Ellsworth characterizes as messy. And I'm like, wait, what does messy mean? She's like, it looks like that. I'm like, okay, that's messy. So the, the, the frequencies are not as well defined. You don't get a beautiful, clean um, frequency spacing. And again, I'm happy to talk more about that. Okay, so before I moved on to what's next, I just want to say a couple of things that make me really excited about learning about the uh, evolution of the, of the Milky Way's disk and can it explain everything in our local disky solar neighborhood. So I think that um, we now have these excellent large scale observations of the galaxy thanks to multi-object IR stellar spectroscopy that lets us see through the dust. And therefore we can test the origin of these mixed populations that we see on small scales. Where are the dragons? So we're in the iridium age of stellar astrophysics and galactic archaeology. But maybe we want to get to the astatine age if we want to do something even better. So, but wait, there's more. And that more is after Sloan 4. So I know some of you have heard about this, um, and you're going to hear more about it right now. So I, just to explain the name, uh, it's called after Sloan 4 because we, while we have put in a large proposal to the Sloan Foundation, and they're going to discuss it at their October meeting, um, we have not yet gotten uh, official funding from the Sloan Foundation. So when that happens, this will turn into Sloan 5. Uh, we, but we don't want to preemptively announce that, that they're going to give us funding when they have so not decided that. Um, so this is <laughs> the ones, they, they try to squeeze everything into one uh, amazing plot, indication of the kinds of things we like to do in after Sloan 4. Um, there are, there are uh, three main mappers, um, the local volume mapper, the black hole mapper, and the thing that I am the program head for is the Milky Way mapper. Um, so the black hole mapper, I'm not going to say much more about it. It's got um, X-ray follow-up, Erosita follow-up. It's got reverberation mapping. It is what it says. It's going after black holes. Um, 
and through their accretion physics and other things. So we are, in those cases, we want to look away from the galaxy out into the cosmos. Um, and so people like Paul Green and Chelsea McLeod can tell you more about, about that. Um, I want to say a couple of words about the local volume mapper, which is looking at nearby galaxies, about six galaxies in the nearby universe, as well as M31, LMC, SMC. And in bright time, it's going to look, yes, indeed you do, at the Milky Way. So this is an integral field unit. Um, so it's going to get spaxels, it's going to get uh, data, oh, spectra, excuse me, for a whole bunch of pixels in these galaxies. And how good is it going to be? I will show you in just a second. So these are slides from the local volume mapper that I swiped from Guillermo Blanc and Neve Drury. Neve is the, is the head of that particular mapper. Um, so Milky Way, Magellanic Clouds, M31 and M33 in a dozen local volume galaxies. So we're going down in the best cases to 10 parsec resolution for an IFU. That's I think, pretty good. Again, why do we want to do this? Well, one of the main things the local volume mapper would like to do is study the connection between star formation gas, um, ISM, and the surrounding stellar populations. <clears throat> so this is a really cool uh, simulation that, um, that they put together. So this is if you have to put uh, each of your pixels on a 100 parsec scale, 50, 25, 10, 1.6. <clears throat> and you can just see the amount of detail that you can learn about the ISM from being able to see this picture as opposed to that picture. Um, that's a single manga fiber, for those of you. This is the integral field unit that's currently working on SDSS, similarly for Khalifa, um, Sami, things like that. So they're taking all of this information and shoving it into one fiber. In the best cases, local volume mapper, um, we'll see things on this resolution uh, for like M31 and M33, it'll be more like 25 parsecs. <coughs> And because the Milky Way is the best galaxy ever, let me focus here on what the local volume mapper is going to do for Orion. So here is the, a beautiful um, ESO image of the Orion Nebula. The Apogee stars, if I push a button, if I push a button, will appear, uh, appear in yellow. So we have a whole bunch of Apogee stars through here. So we can, and we're going to get information on the effective temperature, the um, gravities, that kind of thing. Uh, for these stars from Apogee. Um, and then with the local volume mapper, we're going to get this view, <coughs> excuse me, of the Orion Nebula. So each one of these, again, spaxels is just giving you a glorious, glorious amount of information. Like this, I mean, I don't know if I could definitely tell you it was the Orion Nebula based on this, but I would have a much better shot than with a manga spectrum of this. So just want to emphasize the. Uh, the awesome scales that you can do there for ISM studies. For M31, this is uh, HST fat from Del Canton et al. Um, I don't know if you guys on Twitter get the, the Andromeda bot. I love the Andromeda bot. I'm like trying to diagnose the, stellar, the star formation history of Andromeda one tweet at a time. Um, but this is the kind of thing you look at. And this is the kind of of information we're going to be getting. So you're going to smack down your, your pixels here, here, here. You can count up stars in there. There are countable numbers of stars in there, which I just think is awesome. OK, <clears throat> so the IFUs are awesome, especially when they do things like dithering, as Manga does, is they give you complete spatial information of the galaxy. Apogee and all of the stellar surveys to, uh, to date basically don't do this, or sorry, yeah, basically don't do this, <coughs> excuse me, they um, do pencil beams. So Segway certainly did pencil beams, Guy Iso, Gala maybe is uh, better at this, but still not what I would want it. Um, and yeah, so this gives you the idea when you're looking towards the bulge with Apogee, you're looking at these individual fields, and that's your sampling of the galaxy. <coughs> but, you know, we look at external galaxies, we see structure on kind of medium-sized scales. And we really like to know how that works in the Milky Way. So this kind of sampling is perfectly fine if the underlying galaxy is like a Rothko paper, a uh, Rothko painting. So if it looks like this, and you sampled like that, you pretty much got the picture, right? But what happens if you're sampling like this? And you think, oh, OK, there's a bunch of information here, here, here. And the underlying picture 
looks much more like this. Basquia. Uh, Untitled is the name of the of the uh, the painting. Um, you have missed a whole bunch of relevant information by doing such a, a, a series of narrow beams. So we don't want to be thinking the galaxy looks like this when the galaxy looks like that. So one of the main programs in, in After Sloan Floor is Galactic Genesis, which uh, was spearheaded by John Byrd and Melissa Ness. So this gives you an idea, and again, I think it gives you an overrated idea than it's actually much sparser sampling than this of here we are with Apogee and we're looking out in these directions and this is how well we're doing. Again, you see the pencil beams poking out. Galactic Mapper, or uh, Galactic Genesis, formerly known as Disco, says, you know what? You know who has smarts? Cosmologists have smarts. What have cosmologists learned? Window functions are horrible, awful things. So let's not do that. Let's not do these crappy pencil beam surveys. Let's just get everything. And so the goal here is to uh, choose from the Gaia catalog things that are far enough away and or faint enough that they uh, aren't going to have really great information from Gaia spectroscopy, but are going to have good information from Gaia astrometry and that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a G minus, Gaia, magnitude, Gaia mag magnitude minus H cut, and it's going to give us about 5 million stars. So it's a noise of about 50 um, over the course of five years. To do this, we are going to need to get rid of plates. So if anybody has their eye on a Sloan plate, they are not going to be produced uh, from now until eternity, though I'm sure the plate shop at Wisconsin <laughs> is not yet convinced of that. <laughs> They've been making plates for a long time. We're going to have to go to a fiber uh, positioner. And so that is a big engineering challenge that Rick uh, Pogge is the head of uh, developing that at Ohio State. So we're going to have to, re you know, again, DESI is a very important influence on this in terms of their scheduling software and <coughs> their um, uh, their fiber positioner systems, et cetera. So we are glad that we are not the first people to do this, but boy, do we need it if we're going to get 5 million stars. Another uh, key aspect of the Milky Way mapper is stellar astrophysics. So on this axis here, I've got the J minus K color, and here I have the absolute magnitude in J based on Gaia DR1 information from Lauren MacArthur. Um, and <coughs> this is color coded as a function of age based on um, a basis hall model. So I, I just kind of painted the stars with different ages. Um, Galactic Genesis is going after red giants, lots and lots of red giants. And that's great, because we're going to get a whole bunch of different ages of stars um, in this region right here. We are also going to study stars with convective cores, comparing their seismic uh, properties, particularly their derived masses, with dynamical masses from eclipsing binaries identified with TESS. Um, we are also going to start, this is this down here in the A and F stars. We're also going to look at O and B stars in the galactic disk to try and identify binarity thing, uh, proportions, look at young star clusters, that kind of thing. And as I mentioned in my talk at lunch, the test planet hosts often reside down here, and we're going for them like crazy. <clears throat> now, this is DR1, DR2, nine more magnitudes. So it's not even like, I had to fake white dwarfs on here, because in Gaia DR1, there are no white dwarfs. But we are going to get <coughs> hundreds of thousands of white dwarfs. These are very important, because you can get ages for them. You can also use, um, when you identify them in binary populations uh, and assume that they're coeval, you can use that to understand uh, the initial final mass relation for white dwarfs better, that kind of thing. We're also going to go after uh, everything in the solar neighborhood, the solar neighborhood census. And there are a whole bunch of puppies down here. Um, that Apogee will do very well because it's in the infrared and we can spend time there. So again, this craps out here, but it actually is going to hang down here. And sorry, the things that are bright, highlighted here in bright, are um, things that are close to, this, to the sun. So we do get some of these more massive stars, but we get a whole bunch of low mass stars. And so we're really going to have an excellent idea of the lower end of the mass function. We're almost done. Um, I apologize for this plot, except for the fact that I can answer any question that you have with it. So I kind of like tells me so much, but it, I'm going to walk you through it for just a little bit here. So um, we're also going to be studying binaries, whether or not identified through Gaia, uh, ones that we do spectroscopic follow up on, et cetera. So here's the color coding here. I mean, realistically, because there aren't a lot of super hot Neptunes, you know, we can identify in some small region here. Uh, hot Jupiters, 
um, going all the way up to, to white dwarfs. Period in hours versus the primary mass. This is color coded by the, the minimum secondary mass that we can measure. So you can see if you're very close to a low mass star, you know, we can measure fairly low. Um, if you're, uh, you know, if we're farther away from a, a, a high mass star, then you're a beautiful brown dwarf, and we're going to spend a bunch of time getting orbits for stars and trying to really delineate the brown dwarf um, desert. Over here, you're like, well, why is all of this set to about 1.4? This is the region where in order to be this close to a star with this mass, you have to have gone through a compact envelope phase. So these are compact binaries. X-ray binaries lie here. White dwarf, white dwarf binaries. Gravity wave sources for LISA lie here. So we're going to be identifying these from their photometric variability and getting spectra um, to measure their RVs and constrain their properties. Uh, up here, again, these are the, uh, the binaries that we're going to identify as eclipsing in uh, TESS for A and F stars. And we're going to um, uh, measure their uh, dynamical masses. So in this region here, we're, we potentially could if we had um, if we really wanted to get lower down here to the brown dwarf regime, but we're really focused here for this uh, purpose on, you know, uh, uh, velocity accuracies of about a kilometer. So we're not pushing our instrumentation crazy here. This is also important because A and F stars in the infrared don't have a ton of lines. So we were very conservative there. But for the, for the cool stars where we have lots of lines in the infrared, we really expect to do quite well. Um, so this is for a main sequence star. What happens if we're looking around a white dwarf, which has a much, uh, yeah, there we go. Let me move on to this one here. This one here shows what Gaia is going to do. So where we can get hot Jupiters, Gaia is not going to be able to see the astrometric motion. It has this exactly what you expect. The mass is get uh, lower as you get further separation. And you can see the astrometric movement. So it's very complementary to what we're going to be able to do. Test planet hosts, I put these up here. We're not going to be, um, we can look for false positives in this regime right here. And yeah, and I have, there's other things like this works for the main sequence. On the RGB, you expect nothing here because they will have been swallowed at the tip of the giant branch, et cetera. So there's a lot of information here about what we can do, but I do think it's quite impressive where we can get Jupiters and better yet, where we can get uh, brown dwarfs in this regime and of course M dwarfs and that kind of region up here. The last plot I wanted to show was um, what TESS is going to do for galactic archaeology. Um, so TESS has a continuous viewing zone. Those continuous viewing zones are outlined here in Cyan. Here is the galaxy. And TESS likes to put it in ecliptic coordinates. And I'm like, I don't do ecliptic coordinates. I'm a galactic archaeologist. So I smacked it on the galaxy here. Um, again, now there's going to be um, leaves coming down here. So it's not quite clear where you're going to get these different ranges until it's launched. But somewhere in here are things between 54 days and 351 days. And here are the ones we're going to get some data, at least in the current two-year uh, mission. An extended mission would be awesome, because then we could get more data for a bunch of these things. And this is the best light curves we're going to get, where we have the most power to get the frequency power spectra and get masses here. Um, but this is still quite acceptable. And what I want to point out is it's getting, in these cases here, quite close to the galactic plane. And that makes us very excited. Um, I, I need more ages. I need more, more lines of sight throughout the galaxy. And I think TESS is going to do that. And with AS4, we are going aggressively uh, to get composition, um, temperatures, et cetera, for red giants um, that are on the full frame images, especially in the continuous viewing zone. And we have a Pathfinder program to get some of those right now. All right, so with that, I will just leave you with the overwhelming awesomeness of Sloan 4 and ask if there are any questions.
I'm doing a project um, working with um, uh, Ross Church that's being led by Edita Stan Kute to look at the Apogee RVs compared with the Cambridge binary population model. See if we get agreement, and if that's the case, how many blue stragglers do we expect to exactly answer your question to see? The RV distribution predicts both the 14% of young alpha rich stars that we see and the um, based on the underlying Cambridge binary uh, model. And we have not yet gotten to the answer to that question. Um, I feel based on talking to people like Mark Pinsano that he found the 14% to be quite high. We see 14% young alpha rich stars among the alpha rich population, and he thought that was quite high. Um, but I agree that I think we can, that number is not yet as set in stone as I originally thought. Because globular clusters have estimates, they're really good at really good measurements, but that's a very different environment, so I think it's a bit unfair to travel. But if all stars formed in clusters, then. But globular clusters, right? Yeah, so I, I agree. I have not looked at M67. <laughs> I know they have blue stragglers in M67, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, other questions? So I was wondering, I'm thinking about what the Milky Way looked like maybe five billion years ago, and it, from, you had a plot in there in, in the middle. So as far as I can tell, you have a bunch of high metallicity stars with a radius of about a kiloparsec and then a whole lot of gas that hasn't yet formed stars with a radius of 8-ish or 10-ish kiloparsecs. Uh, so in the error simulation, gas keeps falling in. So if you're to look at it, so this is a bit unfair because what I'm showing here is, sorry, there. What I'm showing here is the present day location of these stars. Right. Right. Okay. So, but if you look at the error simulation as it's happening, um, the disk starts out small, and there's not like it's necessarily a whole, but there is some gas around it, but it's not out to its current size. But gas keeps falling in, and the disk keeps growing larger and larger and larger. So, the, and, does that answer your question? Why is that gas for, forming stars when it's farther out instead of falling all the way into the center before forming stars? Uh, is that just where the density gets high enough? So they do have like they yes they have a, a, a recipe in there for when my gas can form stars based on temperature and, and density and things like that and so it's a subgrid physics which means that they can twist knobs and I'm not sure how much I believe it which is why I kind of want to compare this right. and that to test their subgrid physics um, and I, yeah and I don't know enough about their simulation to, to really answer that you question. Have you have some observational data, which I think is a slide or two before this, that shows those actual ages. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did I go back down? No, I had a, there's a story. There, oh. yes. Oh, well, that, oh, that, that, there. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, there there we go. Go. Yeah. yeah. So now you're seeing some stars that formed subsequent to five billion years ago, probably. You have the red guys, yeah. which are the old things. Right, and then we have, yeah, so we agree with the inside out picture very much that if um, if you look at, yeah, so if you look at the oldest stars, they're like this. If you look at the youngest stars, they're like this. Because we do have some blue points, as you can see, pointing in towards the center. Right. Yeah, um, so we agree with that. Now, whether or not we agree in the quantitative sense is, I think, the next step. Um, but again, I don't think, you know, based on observations of external galaxies, I don't think this was shocking to people to say, you know, for Bada's work, that it would be shocking to people to see this. But again, it's a measurement and, and not so much of an extrapolation, so I appreciate that. Uh, Phil? Yeah, so on your M67 HR diagram, um, hmm? uh, it's not as clean of a break between the stars that have uh, solar, or the solar type C and, and the giants. Mm -hmm. Is that a comment about the measurement uncertainty, yeah. or is that a time scale for the dredge up? Oh, I think it's a comment about the, so, can I hit this one? Sorry. <laughs> Death rays from above. Um, these ones right here, yeah, yeah. So one of the, so I made this plot as an illustration, but one of the things that you know comes back to this plot as well, right? What's up with, with these? Are they consistent with our measurement errors? Or is it saying something uh, that how saying something about how often C over N lies to us? Yes, I agree. You mentioned there was a discrepancy between the Kepler seismology results and your results for the very low mass stars. Could you comment on the Kepler results for the helium burning stars, the helium burning giants versus um, those that are not core helium burning? And do those agree with your 
inferences from the um, chemical analysis? Yes. Um, so the we are reluctant to use red clump stars for um, uh, this test because of mass loss. We are worried that if we measure their present day masses from uh, seismology, um, that is both their initial mass and mass loss. So we're not, so when we look, for example, at NGC 6791, right, so there's the Miglia all, all, all paper, which said um, there looks like there's very, that there's this much mass loss from looking at the seismology, seismic masses from stars at the tip of the red giant branches for stars at the top. Mm -hmm. Um, the problem is, is that we don't have ground truth for the stars of the clump because the eclipsing binary at the, at the, at the turnoff tells us about, I trust it, up the giant branch, tip of the giant branch to red clump no, because of mass loss. Yeah, so like Do Kun An and, and Mark Pinsano are working, uh, th there's arguments back and forth on what the true masses of those red clump stars at NGC 6791, and I don't think Migley at all, at all is the final. Answer. Is that is that answering your question? Sort of. I'll talk to you okay. later. Okay. okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Well, let's thank Jennifer.